there. Hello? Hello. Hello. Is there anyone greater than the Lord? Is there anyone else like him? Is Obama like the Lord? Is Trump like the Lord? Is the American Congress like the Lord? Is the King of Saudi like the Lord? There's a good reason that they're not like the Lord. Because the Lord, like it says, gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him shall have eternal life. Eternal life is something that's tough to understand, tough to comprehend, because we don't and can't measure things that can't be counted. When something is internal, it's like you're saying it's an infinity. And when you put it in infinity, we can't see that number. We don't know what that is. And this is why when the Lord promises eternal life, we have to be glad because what he's offering is something that's without limit. Something that will never stop. Something that will last till the day he comes to take us back home. What can we say to that? Amen is the proper response because God wants us to be able to confirm anything that's truthful. And when it's truthful, the rest of the world knows exactly that we say amen. This morning, our text, if I go back to it real quick, is based in the book of John. And it's John 21, verse 17. John 21, verse 17. Can you read along with me, John 21, verse 17? It says, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you, do you what? Peter was grieved because he asked him the third time. What did he ask him the third time? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, to do what? Let us say a word of prayer before we start. Our Father God in heaven, we are grateful and thankful for your wonderful mercies, your grace, which is abundant and without equal. At this time and moment on your wonderful Sabbath morning, we ask you to be with us, send down the Holy Spirit to guide us and comfort us, console us, and also open us to the word that you have prepared for us today. Use me, Lord, as a vessel. Don't let my opinion run in this. Instead, let your will come first. As we pray in the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Different days bring about different responses, right? There are certain days where sometimes we just don't want to do things that we have to do. The thing that happens is like there are always going to be great times, right, when we all laugh together. But there's also going to be bad times when we're in a bad mood. Who here can tell me that they've ever had a day where they ever had a bad day where they loved it? Have you ever loved a bad day? Raise your hand for me. Nobody. No one's ever loved a bad day. That doesn't make any sense. Who would love a bad day? Of course, for some of you who probably need Christ in your life, you would love if someone else have a bad day, but you need to pray on that. There are certain days where you know you got to get up and go to school. But how many people are happy every day to go to school? No, not everybody's happy every day to go to school. Sometimes you would think to yourself, why do I need to get up to go to school? I don't want to learn. Some of us, every day we need to go to work. But there's some days we wake up and we're like, I don't want to go to work. It, are you always happy every day to go to work? Raise your hand for me. No one here is happy every day to go to work. You already know if you, you have the freedom of choice, you can always choose not to go to work, right? But you also know that freedom of choice comes with consequences. You can choose not to go to work, and then your bills can sit down and get paid. 
then the people can come collect the bills. They can come take your house. They can come take your car. You can always choose to continue not to work. But then everybody else is going to be like, that's your choice. Now I'm going to make mine. I'm getting my money. So we can always choose to do things. And every single day is different because sometimes there are days you want to and sometimes days you don't. Sometimes on the days I want to go to work, I know it's going to be a light day. I know I'm not going to have anything to do. I'm going to be able to take care of whatever business I feel like taking. But I also know there's are days where I know every single minute is going to be filled with work. Of course, they're paying me to work, but who really wants to work hard? <laughs> who really wants to work hard? Sometimes it's a little bit different, but the thing is, the idea is that different days, every day, you have to be a point with something that you don't want to do, but you eventually have to do it. And this even goes to thinking about stuff, thinking about different topics. Because sometimes the topics that we think about can help us move forward in different aspects of our lives. Jesus was always the type of person to bring up topics that was difficult to handle. And the sort of topics that would make people cringe when he would bring them forward. For instance, when we look to Matthew 22, 35, verse 4, when he's speaking to one of the lawyers who are tempting and questioning him, they're asking him, Master, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said, what was the greatest commandment, everyone? In one word? Love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is love thy neighbor as thyself. On these commandments hangs all the law and prophets. And this is where the topic today comes as a question. The question is not for, for me. Of course, if I ask it for myself, it'll be awkward, right? It'll be awkward. Here's a, here's a topic. If I was going to ask you this question, if I ask you this question, don't answer it, please. Don't answer it. I don't want to be embarrassed. The question is, do you love me? Well, stop! <laughs> stop. I don't want you to answer for me. But the question is, do you love me? It's easy to take a look at that question and begin to think, if someone comes to me and asks me, do you love me? Is it going to be a good conversation? Somehow, sometimes. But it can be, it's always awkward, right? Always awkward. It's never just straight and simple. Because sometimes if they say yes, you're going straight up to heaven. If they say no, uh, we're going to have a conversation. And that's a very tough question to have asked. And the thing with the Bible is that whenever the Bible wants to tell you something is truthful, whenever the Bible wants to tell you that something is important, God asks that question to the person in charge. Remember, when Adam and Eve had ate the apple, God's question to them was, where are you? He knew where they were, but he wanted to ask to see if they wanted to come. When the wise men came looking for King Jesus, they asked him, where is the king of the Jews? Where has he been born? We see the signs for him, so where is he? The important question, because now we know exactly that Jesus is supposed to come through. And then even then, Jesus asks, you know, his disciples, whenever, they, whenever he came to him, he asked him a very important, do you want to be fisher of men? To understand exactly what the purpose of Jesus' mission is. And that's the Bible for you because sometimes when the question is asked, you already know it's going to be a profound answer. It's going to be something that you're going to need to write down and keep in your heart. You need to hold on to that. And that's the same as it is today. When we look at John 21, 4 to 17, the moment when Jesus Christ is asking a very honest question. But the thing is, instead of worrying about who Jesus is asking the question to, let's be honest with ourselves. Think honestly about the topic at hand. And the topic at hand is, do you love me? That was the question Jesus asked. You have to think deeply about this, because even if you've been a Christian for a long, long time, even if you read your Bible every day and pray, the question is important, because one day Jesus is going to ask you that question. 
Jesus appeared before the disciples, and this is in John 21, verse 7, and he's in front of them after the resurrection. And they all asked him, they all didn't recognize him, they all asked him to come to eat breakfast with him. And as he came to eat breakfast with them, none of the disciples could recognize who he was. And they, would, they couldn't be dared to ask. Then Jesus came and took the bread that they had and the fish. And then the third, the third time Jesus showed himself he had eaten, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Judah, Jonah, do you love me more than these? He's talking about the food. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Re realize the first time he didn't respond, second time he did, you already feel like the tension is coming. And then he says, tend my sheep. That's what Jesus tells him. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all these things. You know I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. In this event, Jesus restores Peter to his proper place. Because remember, Peter was the one who was asked if he knew Jesus. And he had denied him. Remember when Peter was asked a question? How many times was he asked a question? How many times did he deny him? It's, not, it's important. Jesus asked him how, if he loved him three times for that moment. And that the problem was Peter, if you remember, he was the tough guy. He was the one who would say without question, God, if you get into trouble, I have your back. God, if people come get you, I have your back. He told Jesus that I will look out for you. Same night, when they asked him about Jesus, no, who's that? What are you talking about? It's always that bad, isn't it? Because too often we have people around us who are always so quick to tell us that they have our backs. They all have our backs, they're looking out for us. And one minute they tell you they have our back, let's see, what time is it? At 12.14 they tell us they have our back, at 12.15 once the pressure's too much, uh, sorry, I can't help you. And Peter was in that same situation. So there, with Jesus asking him that question three times, there's an important thing that we have to take a look at. Because for us, that question is also just as important as it was for Peter as it is today. And the proof of your answer will determine your eternal destiny. Your answer to the question will determine your eternal destiny. Let's take a look at it. When you take a look at Jesus asking the question, he asked the question to how many people? How many people did he ask the question, do you love me? One person. He didn't say that to everyone in the room. He asked one person. Mind you, he skipped Thomas, he skipped Nathaniel, he skipped John, James, and all the other disciples to ask one person, do you love me? Every single one of them needed to be corrected. But he picked Peter out of the bunch to prove a point. The answer of do you love me is a personal question. It's a personal question that we have to take into account because when we take a look at our relationship with Jesus Christ, it's always easy to forget or easy to get into the tradition of believing that our, our relationship with Jesus Christ is us as a church to Jesus while forgetting that we have to build and strengthen a personal relationship with God that requires you to not just do what he asks, but when it's time for you to change what you're doing and he tells you, you also have to listen. Jesus demands from us a personal relationship. Revelation 3.20 reads, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, dine with him, and he with me. The most important thing about that verse is that Jesus doesn't say he's going to kick down the door to your heart to come in. He doesn't say he's going to break the door of your heart to come in. He says he's knocking at the door. 
And if someone is knocking at your door and you get up to go open it, clearly that person should be someone you know, someone you respect. Of course, a lot of us, sometimes the door opens up for us and sometimes we get salespeople who come to our house and we have to tell them, no, thank you, I'm not buying anything. We get Jehovah Witnesses who come to our door and we tell them, no, thank you, I'm not buying anything. Of course, if you're someone who really wants to get in with them, you invite them in and you tell them the truth. But you know, oftentimes, friends and family, when they come to the door, you open it wide for them. They don't need to ask for permission. They know they can come in. Is Jesus like that in your hearts? Is it like that in your hearts? Is Jesus like that in your hearts? Is he knocking at the door and you've let him in? Have you already given him a key? Or is he still waiting outside in the cold, waiting for you to let him in? That's what's so important about it. Because he's not going to force himself in. He's going to wait till you let him in, which means you leave Jesus out in the cold. It means you leave Jesus out in the sun. That means you leave Jesus out in the snow. That means you leave Jesus out in the wind. Look at all of us today. A little bit of cold sends us running to heat. Some of us, we can't stand it. I remember I used to be able to walk outside without a coat. I used to be able to walk outside with just a small shirt and be like, this is nothing. Now if I go outside and it's 50 degrees, I'm like, no thank you. Let me go grab my jacket. I go grab my jacket. Imagine Jesus knocking at the door of your heart. Yeah, you leave him outside in the cold. You haven't let him in. The relationship we have to have with Jesus can't just be a one-time thing. Luke 9.23 speaks specifically about what we need to make it. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Daily is the word, not just Sabbath morning. Daily is the word, not just Friday night. Daily is the word, not just Wednesday night prayers. And even then, they're asking you, to, Jesus is asking you to carry your cross. The biggest problem sometimes I have when we read Bible verses, and some people preach on them, is that they don't take it far enough. The verse says, take up your cross. Too many people here take up your cross, and they think, I'm going to take up my burden. I'm going to take up my troubles. I'm going to take up bad things that are happening to me in life. I am sorry. But we have forgotten that a cross is an instrument of torture. We've forgotten that a cross is an instrument of death. You're being asked to die from yourself every day. Every day die, carry the cross to crucify the things that Jesus doesn't want from you and wants you to follow him exactly how you should be following him. It's not just about carrying hard things and carrying obstacles. It's about dying so that Jesus Christ can transform you to the person that he wants you to be. And the question becomes, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? This is an important question for those of you who aren't baptized and those of you who are baptized. And you can answer the questions in many ways. And you can ask like five simple questions for this. For instance, last week, ask yourself this question. Did you pray and talk to him last week, every single day? Did you read his word and know him better every single day? Did you ask Jesus for his guidance every single day? Did you thank him for the cross every single day? Did you even take time to think about him? And these are tough questions to ask, but if you were to put all this stuff on a chart, ask yourself this question. Would you have 100% or would you be less than 100? The questions that we ask can determine the personal relationship that you, that you have with him. If you don't pray and talk to him, 
If you don't really know, read his word to get to know him better, if you don't ask him for guidance, if you don't thank him from the cross, if you do not think about him, I have to give you an uncomfortable truth. Here's the truth. You won't like it. You do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. I have to say it. Because what happens is we automatically assume our church attendance is our relationship when it's actually our daily drive to be with Jesus is where that relationship forms. You all have good friends. And you can't say you're good friends with someone you talk with once a year. How many of you, how many of you have a good friend that you talk to just once a year? What? All right. And how many of you have a good friend that you talk to at least once a week? Yes, of course I know that. How about every day? Every day. <laughs> every day. I see people every day, good friends every day. Every day. Those people you call your good friends because every day you know what's up with them. Every day you know what's happening with them. Every day you're on tabs with them. You know exactly when you need to pray for them. You know exactly when they need your help. You know exactly how you can help them. Someone who call once a year, you can be friends with them, but they may not be your good friend. They might not be your best friend, but they're still a friend. But with Jesus Christ, if he asks you every day for a daily renewal of who you are with him, if that renewal isn't daily, then I can, be, I can rest assured you, you do not have a personal relationship with him. And that goes down to back to our question. Do you love him? Do you love Jesus? It's not about what you say, because it's easy to say you love things. It's, about what, it's not about what you sing either, because it's easy to sing it. It's about what you do. How do you just love someone with just your words? Because even your words, even if you love someone, your actions will tell them. Imagine telling someone you love them, and then you smack them. What type of love is that? Imagine you tell someone you love them and you call them stupid. What type of love is that? Imagine you tell someone you love them, you never check on them. What type of love is that? Action is where love is produced, not with just our words. Because it's easy to just say love. Everybody loves everything. People love cheese. People love food. People love other things like music. I remember a rabbi was saying one time, people say they love fish. But how can you kill something that you love? What do you love to eat? I love eating fish. How can you love fish? You're killing it. There's no love there. You love to eat fish, but you don't love fish. <laughs> you don't love it. And that's where it comes, because if you, the love is there, the actions will show. And then that's why the personal aspect is important. Personally, you talk to Jesus, you know about him, you think about him, and then because of that, you begin to grow a personal relationship. And that personal relationship would eventually lead you, even if you're not yet publicly displayed your love for God, to eventually publicly display it. And there's a second aspect of the question about do you love me that's important to look at, and it's the practical reason, the actionable reason. Act, love without action is something less than love. We all know John 3.16 because God took the action that he said he loved us. The action was the sacrifice of his son. He didn't just say he loved us. He sacrificed his son for, for us. That's how practical love works. And Peter is called to action. Peter is called to action. And this is sometimes where people get a little bit messed up. Because they assume that if someone loves you, there's no conditions. True. The question is, when someone loves, love is the cause, everything else is the effect. 
See, every time Jesus asked Peter if he loved him, he said he did. Jesus would reply, then feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Show me. That's what Jesus was saying. Do you love me? Show me. That's what Jesus told Peter again. Do you love me? Show me. If you love Jesus, that's the cause. And the effect of that cause is that you will keep his words. The effects of that cause will be that you will follow his commandments. The effects of that cause will be when it's time to produce the word, you will be able to pronounce it to everyone without any other reason for why you love the Lord. The cause and effect started back all the way in Genesis. For example, when you look at, say, for instance, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve didn't have a condition. God didn't give them any condition. God told them, you can have everything in the garden, just don't go to this tree. That's not a condition. A lot of us would say that God eventually put that in there to trick them, to get them. But he never, he never put that as a condition. He said, just don't touch it. But Adam and Eve, because they touch the fruit, the cause, what was the effect? That we die. When the Pharaoh, for instance, refused to listen to God's proclaim it, to let his people go. The Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. That's the cause. What was the effect for the Pharaohs? Plagues. God doesn't give us conditions. He gives us a word, and how we interact with it produces the effect. So the question, do you love me, is a valid and relevant question because it's a practical question that demands evidence. Some people will say that God's love is toxic because it seems like the only thing he wants from us is, is only when he wants it and we have to give it to him. The problem is you're looking at it from a different perspective because too many people, when they think about loving someone, they assume that they can abuse that person. They assume they can take advantage of that person. Imagine all the people you know who are in love with each other. The one guy or the one girl or the brother or sister who keeps doing terrible things. But because they know they have someone's unconditional love, they just walk up to them and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Oh my goodness, can you please forgive me? And the person who loves them forgives them. But they never learn to stop being abusive. They never learn to stop treating people with disrespect. They never learn that God's creation needs to be treated in a fashion that requires respect. And in the same way that Jesus asked Peter if he loved them, he didn't put a condition for the love. He said, if you love me, your actions will prove it. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. The Holy Spirit guides us in the, Holy, in, in the New Testament and that whenever we need it, it will get to us. If we love him, we will keep his word. For instance, Romans 12, 12 says, do not conform to this world, but ye be transformed by the renewing of your spirit. How often do we renew our spirit? Romans 12, 9 says, let love without dissimulation. Love without dissimulation. Hate things that are evil and always keep to what is good. How often do we keep to what is good? How often? And don't, 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 don't take it, don't, don't try to be technical about it. Too often, the thing we think is that because we don't murder, we don't commit evil. You're committing evil when you're prideful. You're committing evil when you're negatively gossiping. You're committing evil when you let your mouth run around and talk bad about other people. You're committing evil when you take money and never get back. Those things are still evil. Don't think just because you don't kill, because you don't murder, that you're not evil. Do you do and point to good things? Do you 
Clean away from fornication, uncleanliness, covetedness, foolish talking. Do you move away from those things? Or are those things that we continually have to battle? If you know you love him, do you keep his word by always praying without ceasing? How often do you think you need to pray? The biggest problem that happens sometimes with our young people is that a lot of them think prayer has to be a formal moment. They need to get their leaves shown. They need to get their Bibles. They need to get a group of people together to begin a prayer meeting. When in reality, what they have to do is pray to God in their heart. You don't often have to close your eyes to pray. Imagine driving and in the moment you have to pray. Speak to God there. That's prayer. That's prayer. You might think just because you're at work in front of a computer typing away that, oh, I'm too busy to pray because, you know, I have to get down on my knees to pray. You don't need to get down on your knees in the office to pray. You can do it if you want to. People are respected. But you can always pray in your heart. You don't need to necessarily sit here right now and not say a word of prayer for me. You let your heart speak to the Lord. Prayer doesn't have to be just a formal event. It can be a connection. And if you love God, you'll keep that word to pray without ceasing. Jesus asks those important questions. Do you love me? Because it's a practical question that requires you to take action. It involves action. It's not just about what you sing. It's not just about what you say. It's about what you do. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, Jesus, if you love me, keep my commandments. Simple. But the very important aspect there is if you love me. The love that you have to show has to be sincere. It's easy to talk about love. It's, it's so easy. It's too, sometimes it's too easy. Love loses its power. The word should be able to change people's lives when you say, I love you. But sometimes we use it so much here and there, everywhere, for everything and every place, that you begin to wonder, how can the same word that someone used to say for me, they say for a car? The same word they used to say for me, they say for a dog. The same word they used for me, they say for something they love to eat. But in the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, it's important that you don't miss this important point. Keeping the commandments demonstrates true love based on a true, real relationship. And the relationship is our ultimate goal. If Jesus was to come here today and ask you these questions, how many of us would be able to give an honest answer? If Jesus sat right next to you, imagine Jesus sitting right next to you, and he asked you, how much do you pray? Would you be able to answer him? If he sits right next to you and asks you, how often do you go to church? Would you be able to answer him? If he sits right next to you and says, how much do you give? Would you be able to answer him? If he sits back next to you and says, how much do you study the Bible? Will you be able to answer him? If none of these you could answer, would you be able to answer this question? Do you love me? Would you be able to answer that question? Because that question and the answer to your question will determine how you live your eternal life. Let us always keep in mind that the relationship that we want to form with our Lord Jesus isn't just a relationship of benefits. It's a relationship where love that we have for Jesus is true, and it's based on a connection that we want to keep. Because the minute that love is founded in Jesus, the problems that we have in church, the problems that exist in society will disappear. Because we won't be doing stuff for ourselves. We'll be doing them to praise and love our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you.